And some of the people that we entertain are very, very pushy. And we have to be very careful not to let our guard down, not to yield in order to have a friend, not to yield in order for them to like me, not to back down a little bit in order for them not to be offended by me. But you see what the Bible said? The Bible said people don't like it when you're righteous. People don't like it when you're holy. It annoys them. I've had it happen to me. My own sister, she's my late sister now, but my own sister, when I first got saved, this is what she used to do. She would say, oh, girl, I heard this. Oh, no. I said, what's wrong? I can't tell you. Man, that's, that's really a bummer. What are you talking about? Oh, it's a good, juicy, dirty joke, and I can't tell you. It's got cuss words in it. And boy, I tell you, you are really a killjoy. Oh, well. Why did she say that? Because my family saw the 180 degree change in me and I didn't compromise one iota. Now, I didn't mean I never fail, but for, for thank God, they never saw me fail. So to them, it was like I was walking the straight and narrow, like walking a tightrope. But it, it wasn't like that for me. I was just trying my best and I wasn't always doing my best, but they could see such a change because I stopped smoking, I stopped cussing, <laughs> I stopped hanging out with folks that wanted to take me to bed. I stopped, there's a whole lot of stuff I stopped doing. So they saw the change, but you know what I had to do after a while? And it wasn't because anything was wrong with them. I had to stop going by my sister's house because she made me want to smoke. She didn't make me, but being around it. And my family would cuss. I mean, they cuss like sailors. Oh, I mean, they cuss like sailors. And I was there to be an example, but I also had to guard my thing, right? So I would stop going over for a while and build myself up really good. And then I would only go prayerfully. Okay, Lord, let somebody be touched by something I do, something I say. Other than that, I've got to curtail my visits. I hated that because my sister and I were so close. But I was so new and so weak. <laughs> so anyway, so I had to do that. No, no. Mine, mine. You know, I had to I had to be like that child that didn't want to lose her goodies. Didn't I just got them? I sure didn't want to lose them. <laughs> okay. So, another thing you have to watch out for. I noticed a, a, a lady I know years ago. She ended up with a roommate. And her roommate was really really nice. Really nice people. She had given her heart to the Lord. Unless she's talking to another Christian, you wouldn't really know it. Because that roommate stayed with her so long that she went all the way back to her cousin, all the way back to, you know, she wants a little piece of tail every once in a while. She'll go to, you know, her ex-husband. You know, it just, she's lost her resolve. And see, one thing God showed me is cleanliness does not leave a mark. It leaves, uh, it, it will leave an impact, but it doesn't leave a, a mark. Only dirt leaves a mark. Only dirt. So if you touch something with clean hands, you won't leave a mark. But if you touch something with dirty hands, everybody will know you just touched it. Which means that if, I'm struggling, you guys, because I'm, anyway. Which means if you keep your hands clean, that's all you got to do. Keep your hands clean. You will have impact. 
But you have to be careful not to be around dirty environments. Because the dirt, you ever wear all white? All white. I mean, it's just like pure white. White is the driven snow, snow white. And you're walking around a place that's dusty and musty and crummy and icky and nasty. And you're looking around saying, oh no, I wore the wrong clothes for this. Well, what happens? Before you know it, something gets on your arm, something gets, I mean, it just finds you. Dirt finds you when you're all white, when you have all white on. Don't ask me how, it just does. Well, it's the same way when you are in environments, you're at the movies or you're at a restaurant. Um, it can be very neutral areas where there's really not that much harm. But the crowd you're hanging with or the movie you're watching, yeah, or the person who wanted to take you to the restaurant is not just a friend. This person digs on you, baby. They like you. Okay? You're trying to get away from all of that. And they're trying to reel you in. So even though it's a, it, it's a nice situation and a nice setting, you have to guard what you do, where you do it, who you do it with, if you do it at all. Sometimes we think things are harmless. Some people read books. I mean, some of you are reading books that you shouldn't be reading. Some of you, when you hang with your family, you hang with them on their terms. You don't hang with them on your terms, which means if they pull out an X-rated movie, if they pull out bang, bang, shoot them up with a whole bunch of naked scenes and all of that, you get out of the room and go sit in the kitchen. Make a stand. You don't have to uh, bash them out for doing it. It's their right. But you get up and you change your location where you are not taking any of that in. And they will notice after time when you're over there, when they turn on those kind of things, they notice, how come they're always leaving when we... It's like certain ones, oh yeah, they'll stay. But when we turn on, they leave. And then they'll start putting two and two together. Ah, I see. They really don't watch that stuff anymore. And they'll be careful about what they watch when you're around. Because now it has made an impact. They see it. They see your stand. They're not hearing it as a nag. They see it. They see you bearing fruit. You're in a crooked and perverse generation. You have to shine like lights. And you cannot dim your light to blend in with their darkness. It does not work that way. It doesn't work. It does not work. My niece told me one day, she said, when, uh, when we were uh, yakking on the phone. And she said, I'm Pat. Do you know of all the people in our family? And I'm not bragging on myself. I'm trying to make a point. This is the impact I'm talking about. She said, of all the people in our family that gave their hearts to the Lord, you are the only one, excuse me, you are the only one that sticks out in my mind. And that's because you made such a drastic change. Everybody else gradually went in and out, but you made a drastic change. And I started laughing. I said, well, the reason is because I was so drastically jacked up. I couldn't afford to soft pedal this new walk with God. I couldn't afford to. I would have been all the way back out there within a matter of months. It would have been over. Game over.
I had to be drastic. I what a lot of people call it radical. It's so radical. Well, I'm not trying to be radical. I'm trying to be, uh, I am contending for the faith. I have to fight for what God gave me. I have to fight to get it and fight to keep it. And there are certain things I can't do, certain neighborhoods I can't go into, certain buildings I can't walk into, certain books I can't read, certain games I can't play, certain places I can't play those games. Certain dresses I can't wear. Certain blouses I can't wear. Certain types of jewelry. Certain types of makeup. Because some things are seductive. Some things, they make you look pretty, but they're seductive. Think about it. What if I dressed now the way I dressed when I was unsaved? You would be looking at 10 inches of cleavage. The makeup would be 10 times heavier. There would be a cigarette in my mouth. And every other word would be a cuss word. Because I used to cuss like a sailor and smoke like a chimney. So if I'm going to represent, people need to see it from afar. A friend of mine who's a minister, she's a pastor. She and I walked into a bar that I used to hang out at. Why did we go to the bar, you say? Because we had flyers. I did not have issues with alcohol, so that wasn't a problem. I had issues with men, so I went with a woman. <laughs> I made sure I didn't go by myself. She and I went in there to pass out flyers to let them know that we were having an evangelistic outreach on a particular night or a particular week to invite them to come. Well, most of them, unless they ran into me at a grocery store, hadn't seen me because once I got saved, it was ixnay on the arbe. I did not go to the bar, period. So what happened? Now, there was no harm in me going because I went to shoot pool. But the environment was conducive to seduction. And seduction might make little Jacarina pop out the box. And I'm trying to keep that girl dead because I'm mortifying the deeds of the flesh. So I can't go there and shoot pool. I can go to a billiard place, but not there. So she and I are there with flyers inviting them to come out and join us at a service. So, what does one of the brothers say? Now, I didn't have any makeup. I didn't have any makeup on. I mean, I was about as plain as plain could be. I wasn't exactly looking all that fashionably uh, attractive. <laughs> anyway, so I'm standing with her. And one of the guys looked at me and he said, Pat, is that you? And I said, yeah, how you doing? He goes up and down like this. He said, girl, you are glowing. And I'm like, I have no makeup. My hair just looks plain. Okay. He's like, you are glowing, girl. What happened? You're so different. You look so beautiful. You just, oh my goodness. What happened to you? I said, I got saved. I gave my heart to the Lord. He said, girl, you can see it on you. You can see it. I said, so you coming? He said, nah, wait a minute now. He wasn't quite ready. But he, there was an impact. He saw the difference. All I said was, hey, how you doing, so-and-so? And he turned around, Pat, is that you? So my point is, people ought to see Jesus in you from afar. Just like you can spot a prostitute on the street, out there doing business. You can spot somebody up to no good. You, they, they just have the look of mischief on them. They dress for the whole occasion. I mean, they look it. You should look the part, act the part, be the part.
My father told me years ago there was a man. Check this out. Talk about contending for the faith. Mm. Some contending takes courage. This man who knew my father told my father something that he didn't know. It blew him away. It stuck with him to the day I led him to the Lord. And that was about 50 years or 40 or 50 years in his past. That's how old he was. Anyway, so he said, this man, the only Christian that ever left an impact on him, the only one claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ, told him he had to do the hardest thing he ever had to do. And he was so glad God protected him. He had to knock on a man's door, a man he had hung with for years, hung out in the streets, partying, boogieing down, getting drunk, getting high, whatever, talking trash. He had to knock on a man's door, ask him to please forgive him as he returned a gold watch to that he had stolen from him back in the day and was still hanging on buddy buddy. That man was contending for the faith, baby. He was doing whatever it took to get loose, to cut loose of all those strongholds that Satan had on him. He was a thief and he had to own up to it. Can you imagine how scary that had to be to go up to somebody you've been hanging with for five or ten years, knowing that ten years ago you stole this watch from them. You always made sure you didn't wear it when you were around them. But you wore that bad boy. You sported that sucker. And you smiled in their face. Smiling faces. Sometimes pretend to be your friend. And this guy was buddy-buddy in all those years and had to suck it up, go knock on the door, humble himself, and expose the dastardly deed he had committed and give him back his watch. The man didn't even know he was the one that stole it. Oh. Mm. See, when you contend for the faith, you will do whatever it takes to stay free because it means that much to you. You don't trust yourself. You don't trust them. And you sure don't trust him, the devil. So you have to do whatever it takes to contend for the faith. I remember one of the guys I had seen, hadn't seen him for a while, he came knocking on my door. Now, you know what he's knocking on the door for, don't you? Yeah, he didn't come for play. He came for a roll in the head. And I had to talk to him through the door. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> Store's closed. Out of business. I mean, he was just, you know, one of my running buddies. We just do that every once in a while. And he was like, well, what's wrong? You know, you got you a man? I said, no, I'm in Jesus Christ now. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I wonder why I haven't seen you around. Yep. You want to find me? I'm in the church. Well, well, let me just drop in for a note. Sorry, Charlie, can't come in. I would not let that man in my house. I wouldn't open the door and talk to him in the door. Nope, he got the voice through the wood. He was not getting in my door. Wasn't getting a foothold. It's, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's just that desperate and that drastic. It's that extreme at times. Do you trust yourself to warm yourself by the devil's fire? 
You really trust yourself to go that far? I couldn't. I couldn't. I knew me. God showed me me so crystal clear that I knew this weakling was not strong enough to handle the slightest little indulgences. I couldn't afford it. Could not afford it. And some of you can't. Some of you go golfing with your buddies. And you know when you go golfing, they're going to be talking some trash about some ladies. Yeah, they're going to be talking about some booty. Yeah, buddy. A catch they just got last week and how good that was in the bed. And you are either going to sit there and laugh and go along with them, or you're going to make a stand and you're going to say, I'll catch y'all. Uh, I'm going to go um, over here, grab a uh, whatever, till y'all get through talking all that nonsense. I don't want to hear that. Well, wait a minute. What happened to you? Oh, you know what happened to me, brother. I'm saved. You know, I ain't playing that no more. And I sure ain't going to take no chances here to get me all hot and bothered. I'll see y'all later. And they see you trying. They see you pursuing holiness with all your might. You're not putting them down. You're letting them know you can't handle it. Catch you on the rebound. What stand are you making? Are you really contending for the faith? Do you turn that internet off when something pops up you shouldn't be looking at? Nobody can see you. Nobody's around. You can if you want to. But do you? Hmm. Don't answer too fast now. Don't want you lying. <clears throat> Now, we all blow it. I've had plenty of failures. But how many more failures, how weaker might my, my walk have been had I not worked on my foundational faith with all my might first? Everybody falls short of the glory of God. They'd be lying if they told you they didn't. But how often, how easy is it for you Hmm. When you go out, how are you dressing? Do your clothes look like a child of God or do your clothes look like the way you always look before you ever knew who God was? How is your conversation? Are you gossiping like you used to gossip? Girls sitting around talking about sister so-and-so and the woman down the street and who she's screwing behind her husband's back and y'all up there quack quack. <laughs> Are you in on that? What kind of example are you setting? Are you in on that? Somebody flirts with you behind your wife's back. Somebody telling you how fine you are. And you're letting them know, I'm married. But guess what? What does the woman say? Well, what does that have to do with it? I'm talking to you. And you're sitting up there getting all big chested. Ooh, somebody finds me handsome and her debonair. <laughs> yeah, right. And you getting off on it. Instead of shutting that whole thing down and getting the heck out of Dodge. I remember... When we were at a meeting, we had an overcomers meeting, and I had to I had to give a prophetic word. And I told uh the whole group, it was men and women, it was a co-ed group. And I said, Now, God just gave me a word. I don't know who it's for. So whoever it is, I hope you really take heed to this warning. But God is saying to me to say to you, one of you sitting here has got a female friend and you're trying to save your marriage 
And this female friend is just a running buddy. It's nothing to it. You're not doing anything. You're not flirting with her. You're not going there. However, if you continue with this friendship, it will go there and blow up in your face. Not only will it blow up in your face, you will lose any chance of ever saving your marriage. You will lose the relationship with your kids. And this thing will blow up with repercussions that will last you almost 25 years. It was just that specific. Now, nobody said anything. Everybody was on the down low, real hush, hush, hush. But after everybody left, one of the brothers came back. And they said, uh, are you in a hurry to get home? And I said, no, I, I said, uh, I said, Milton's good. He's, uh, he's already had his dinner. Uh, well, I just wanted to uh, tell you that man you were talking to was me. That man, I'm telling you, is the smartest thing he could have done. When we got through talking and he got through sharing how he was starting to get attracted to her, but he hadn't done anything, had no intention of it, but he was attracted and he knew she was attracted to him, but he was shining that on like he didn't even notice it. He took heed and cut that relationship off like it was a gangrenous, a gangrenous leg. Cut it off. Cold turkey. And what, five years later, I'm out with Milton eating. And who do I see coming up to my table but the man and his wife? And they're back together and doing great. <laughs> You know how that made me feel that God used me for something like that? But the thing about it is, he listened. He paid attention. He did the drastic thing. Hurt feelings, whatever, had to incur. He did what he had to do. How many of you are willing to do those drastic things? To contend for your faith. To guard what God has given you to guard what God has done in you and to guard your fruits of righteousness that you have already started to bear. Mm. Okay. Father, I pray right now that you get the point across. If I didn't do that good of a job, please, Father, get the point across. Make it plain. If there's anything I didn't touch on, Lord, touch on it in their private prayer time. In Jesus' name I pray, Father. Only your anointing breaks the yoke, and I pray that you anoint whatever they've heard and let it break yokes, Father, in people's lives, that they don't allow the devil to use other people to spoil their feast of charity, to come in and weasel into their life and cause problems and, and separate relationships and wreak havoc and cause strife and anger and lust and whatever else they could do because dirty people leave a mark. And I ask you, Father, let them know the difference between a person who is there as a friend and a person who is bearing filth everywhere they go, carrying dirt, spreading mud, mud slingers. Help them know the difference, Father. We know there are people out there that are harmless. They just need you. But there are other people out there that are venomous. And we ask you to give us discernment. Give us discernment to know what activities to participate in, whether to go to a barbecue or whether not to go to that barbecue. Help us not get caught up in wanting to be liked, but to get caught up in wanting to please you. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.